Welcome to our lecture online. Let's go take another look at the precession of Mercury. It turns out that if you take a look at Mercury, Mercury has a very eccentric orbit, at eccentricity at 0 0.206, which is only uh, exceeded by Pluto, which is technically no longer a planet. It's now considered a dwarf planet. So of all the planets, Mercury is the closest to the Sun and has the largest eccentricity. And because of that, it is most likely to have the greatest what we call precessional velocity. In other words, if we draw a straight line between the aphelion and the perihelion, that line slowly shifts at a rate of 574 arc seconds per century. Now, that doesn't look like a lot because an arc second is a very small amount, so 574 arc seconds is a, just a small fraction of a degree. But nevertheless, they were able to measure that. They've always known that for almost 200 years as to how big that precessional rate was. But when they then calculated the cause of that precessional rate, taking into account where all the planets were located as those other planets were around the sun, it turned out that 574 seemed like too big of a number. It turns out they calculated something that was more along the lines of 531 arc seconds. This is what it should have been. There was an additional 43 arc seconds that they could not account for. And it turns out, when Einstein came up with his theory of general relativity, that that's where the 43 missing arc seconds went. The additional 43 arc seconds were caused by the gravitational shift by the warping of space around the sun, and therefore Mercury experienced a slower time here and a larger time there, which caused an additional precessional rate equal to 43 arc seconds. Of course, at the time, they didn't know that that was 43 arc seconds. There was just a 43 arc seconds they couldn't account for. But then finally, they were able to calculate the equation to calculate the additional shift caused by the gravitational influences on the time that Mercury would experience close to the sun versus farther away from the sun, which should cause an additional 43 arc seconds. So they calculated the equation, and here it was. Now, let's plug in the numbers and see if it comes out to be 43 arc seconds. Notice that r is the average distance between the sun and Mercury, which is about almost 58 million kilometers. We have to convert that to meters. The period of the orbit of Mercury is almost 88 days. We have to convert that to seconds. This is the speed of light, and that's the eccentricity. And the result is the number radians for each revolution around the sun, for each 88 days or so. So let's go ahead and now calculate, uh, calculate what that number is in terms of arc seconds per century, and we will be surprised about the result. So this is equal to 24 pi cubed times the radius. The radius is going to be 57.91 times 10 to the 9th meters. That's how many billions of meters. We have to square that, divided by the period. So the period will be 87.97. We need to square that. And then we have 86,400. Oops, I got a little ahead of myself here. 86,400 seconds. We have to square that as well. So together, that forms the number of seconds for each orbit, the period. We have to square the period. Speed of light squared, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. And then we have the quantity 1 minus E squared. E is eccentricity at 0 0.206 quantity squared. Oh, the square goes inside like that. Okay. Let's find out what we get. So we need a calculator starting with uh, 0.206 squared at. <clears throat> this is going to be in radians per revolution. That would be 5.0126 radians per revolution, per one revolution. So that would be in number of days, that would be 87 point nine seven days so that many radians per oh that's not all i'm missing something that would be awfully fast uh, i missed the times 10 to the minus 7 radians okay so so far uh that's a tiny tiny number it's in radians but now we need to convert that to arc seconds so radians now we have to multiply that times 180 divided by pi to convert that to degrees per radian. 
So if we make that change, we multiply the times 180 and divide by pi, and now we get, so this is equal to 2.872872 times 10 to the minus 5 degrees, degrees um, per 87.97 days. Okay? Now we can convert that to arc seconds. So there's 3,600 arc seconds in the degrees. Okay, so we multiply the times, 3,600, and now we get, so this is equal to 0 0.10339 arc seconds per 87.97 days. So now let's convert that to the number of arc seconds per year. So now what we need to do is we need to multiply the times 365 and divide by 87.97 equals, so now we have this is equal to 0 0.42898898 arc seconds per year. And now of course we have to multiply the times 100 to convert it to arc seconds per century. So times 100, and guess what? So this is equal to 42.9 arc seconds per century. Imagine the shock of the people who calculated this for the very first time. They, through observation, knew that what they were measuring versus what they calculated had a difference of 43 arc seconds. Through the new general theory of relativity, they came up with an equation that would calculate the additional precession velocity, the additional shift per century due to the gravitational effects and the time dilation effects at perihelion versus aphelion. They came up with the equation, they plugged in the numbers, and they got the exact number that was the difference between what they observed and what they measured, calculated if they did not take into account the gravitational effects due to the special, not the special, but the general theory of relativity. Wow, I would have liked to be there to see their, the look in their faces when they got that result and go, wow, it actually works. Another proof that the general theory of relativity is very real, as real as you and me, it is absolutely part of our universe, and it's there, and the effects can be measured and calculated in every respect. Another proof for the general theory of relativity. You're not real. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a figment of my imagination. No. <laughs> <laughs> so is that the one Einstein calculated? Or, or no, Einstein said it was there. So he predicted that that would be the case. Mm -hmm. They had to come up with the equations, and I, it was probably a, a unison, an, a, an effort by a number of people coming together trying to figure out what that would be. They calculated it. It exactly explains the difference between observed and expect it. So what do you think of that equation? I don't know. I have to go find out if you're interested. Was it a bunch of people? It was probably a combination of a number of people working together, yeah. Yeah, usually that's the case. I think it's amazing. <laughs>